I think it's time to introduce our next speaker. His name is Ken Wheeler. He's from Formidable in the United States. Ken, come up here. Where are you? Ken Wheeler is the director of open source at Formidable, which is a JavaScript agency in the US. He has been an active open source contributor. Um, and um, since Facebook just officially announced um, their rewrite of React called Fiber, you may have heard of it. Uh, I think they announced it at F8, right? Um, Ken is going to show you uh, some fun examples of why Fiber is awesome. Give a warm round of applause for Ken Wheeler. Hey everybody, I'm Ken, Ken Wheeler. Ken underscore Wheeler on Twitter. You should go there and follow me immediately. You can find me over there sticking it to the man. I work at Formidable, and uh, here I'm today to talk about, uh, I'm here today to talk about fun with custom renderers, fiber custom renderers. And uh, keyword there is fun, which is a little bit difficult, right? Fiber renderers are kind of complex kind of a tall order to have fun with this technical of a talk, but I'm gonna see what I can do. Uh, all right. So if you guys have not heard of Fiber, I'll give you a brief overview. It's part of a <laughs> balanced diet, but we're here to talk about uh, React Fiber, which is a React core algorithm rewrite, right? Uh, so I'm sure if you've done React, you've seen this chart here. Um, where you, know, you see, can see a, a part of the, the tree getting invalidated and then re-rendering, right? So the React Core algorithm, you have a reconciler. And what that does is, you know, you know, the virtual DOM, you take the original tree and then the updated tree and the reconciler figures out the differences between both of those. It figures out what needs to change. Right? And then your renderer is gonna get those updates and it's gonna apply them to the target rendering environment. Okay? So, sounds like a, a pretty solid setup. Why, why are we rewriting it? Right? It's getting rewritten to allow for priority-based scheduling of updates. Right? Um, and each individual update operation is called a unit of work. And in Fiber, they can have a priority, they can be deferred, they can be reused, and they can be canceled, among other things, right? So, if you wanted to, you could prioritize an animation update over something like a data update uh, to increase your performance. There's something that you can't currently do now. And uh, scheduling is important, and I'll prove it to you. So if you had some things that you wanted to do today, say, get drunk, take a test, put on pants, right? In a world without scheduling and priority, where you're gonna approach this task list, list linearly, right? you're probably gonna fail your test because you went to it drunk. You might not even make it to the test and get arrested because you showed up without pants, right? But what if we could control the scheduling of, of our tasks here? You're gonna pass your test, graduate, and throw back a bottle. So aside from that, what else is fun about fiber here? And uh, for me personally, it's the first class custom rendering API which is, doesn't actually exist yet. It sort of does, but it's not exposed. Um, I'm gonna show you a tweet here between me and Mr. Dan Abramoff. So this is two weeks ago, and I had already had this talk written, proposed already and set. Um, up to this point, when you create these things, you know, you'd import them from React DOM lib, right? Uh, when they publish React DOM, you have a lib folder in there, and then they switched over to uh, you know, the flat packaging. And, and Dan's like, yeah, yeah, so you, you can't do that anymore in, in the latest Fiber Alpha. I was you know, notably surprised. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Um, but the second part of his tweet is the important part, which is you know, that they'll find a way before uh, cutting React 16, which means we're not, we're not doing it in this hacky way anymore. We're not gonna just you know, import from lib. You know, we're gonna have a first class interface for that. And that's exciting. Um, so if you don't know what a custom renderer is, right? I'd like to start first with components, elements, and instances so we can get clear on terminology here. Uh, I'm sure everybody here has seen this. Uh, this is your React component, right? And this is a, a class-based one, but you also have the functional ones. Um, create class, not so much anymore, but it is what it is. Um, an element is what happens when you either use JSX with a component or directly call React create element. What you're doing there is you're returning this uh, you know, it sets it up to return a tree that describes 
you know, what, what your, your renderer should be painting to the target, right? Um, and then in, in React, an instance here is what this refers to. So if you have like a, a, a class component, uh, something, you know, with state or, or what have you, um, you know, static properties, uh, that's what this refers to. It's, you know, it's an invisible instance of the component that you're going to use in your logic. So in Fiber, it's a little bit different, the terminology, so I wanted to note that. Um, you know, your, your instance is going to be, you know, an instance of an element. Right, so so rather than uh, you know your instance being like this, this backing portion of the component, uh, it's an instance of an element. And what an element is is, for example, in React DOM, when you create an instance of an element, um, which you're returning, like create like create element in the DOM. You know, you're creating a DOM element. That's your element. Right? So what renderers do is they turn element descriptions, that, that tree that you're getting back when you create an element with JSX, it's turning that into target instances. Right? So uh, up until this point, up until we had the custom stuff, uh, there were a couple of custom renders that are notable, React Native mostly, um, then React Native Windows, React Blessed, if, uh, if you haven't seen that, it lets you render to the terminal, um, and React Hardware by the lovely Dustin Kasten, which lets you use uh, you know, JSX to describe and operate hardware, like Arduinos, which is bananas. Um, those are all examples of stack renderers, right? So historically, to write that, uh, it's, it's, it's been a little difficult to get that going. What you had to do is you had to use React Injection to override certain parts of React and React DOM. So here you would have React Injection, you would inject a, a component class, you know, your own custom component class. So in Fiber, this gets a little bit easier. Right? You have a, a little bit more structured way to do this rather than just overriding stuff. Uh, and it's called a host config. Right? So here's an example here of the fiber reconciler. Uh, you're going to go ahead and require that. You can pull in your host config. Um, and then you just create it right there. You pass the host config right into the fiber reconciler. And then you have these two methods that are pretty much the bread and butter of your rendering. You have create container and update container. Create container is what you... Uh, create your container with, update container. Believe it or not, updates the container. <laughs> so this is a host config. Check that out. That looks fun, right? You're going to have fun here today? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so rather than go through each one of those things and say what each one does, uh, I'd like to take a look here at the, the renderer lifecycle so you can kind of understand how these things work and you know, how it, the, the renderer itself generally works. Right? So if we have a component like this, where you have a div and you know, a paragraph tag with test inside of it, when we render this to the DOM, so I, I took a really cutting edge approach to uh, exposing how this works. I'm gonna show you guys that in a moment. Uh, it's this console log technology. <laughs> I, uh, I put console.log inside each one of these host config methods so that we could have introspection into how this works. So uh, without further ado, <laughs> Uh, we could look at this right now and see, you know, kind of exactly how it works. You know, you don't have to really worry about the, like, the first five there with the, the context and the should set text content. But right down there in the middle, you see create instance P. So it's going to actually, uh, it's going to build it from the inside out, right? The smallest element down there. So it's going to create that, that paragraph tag, right? It's in the middle there. Um, it does finalize initial children, which is, you know, if it, if it has text as a child, a string child, it's going to go and, you know, apply that. That's, that's when it's finalizing that. Um, then it's going to go and it's going to create the div right there. It does append initial child. Because the P is a, is a child of the div, you know, it, it then appends it to that div. Right? It finalizes the initial children on that. You know, it's all set. Um, and then prepare for commit and append child to the root div, which is what you're rendering to. So this entire time, you know, you're building it up on a fragment all the way up the tree, and then that gets appended to your root container. Right? Um, Let's take a look at another one here, so you can see some more of these methods. Uh, this is the same thing, but with free-floating text just hanging out there. You have, you have test there and then test two inside the P. You're going to see a couple more in here. Um, notably, create text instance. Right? So React DOM is the only one, the only render that I've worked with where you have free-floating text. If you have React Native, usually it's inside of a text tag. Um, but in React DOM, you, know, you can have text wherever. You know, it's getting put in HTML. Um, so they have text instances there. And it's going to create those and, you know, pretty much follow the same pattern all the way down. Um, 
Then if we looked at this one that does an update, I don't want to show you the, the update cycle because it's not just a one and done. This render is supposed to, you know, things update within your application. You know, the render is handling that too. Um, so here we have some state, right? We say set timeout and we update it. Um, here we return, you know, pretty much the same thing as before, but with a state-driven child on the page. Okay? Uh, you're going to see at the top there it says finished initial render. So we don't have to worry about the initial render, right? But uh, after that, this is, this is where the updates take place. So you're going to see prepare update, right? Which is a, a part of the host config. Um, and it's going to have that update. And then down here, you're going to uh, continue to see that down to commit update. And commit update is where you actually apply that update. So in React DOM, you know, you're going to apply that update one way because it's, uh, you know, it's HTML, you're targeting the DOM. Um, in another render, if you were going to commit an update, you might do that a bit differently. I mean, you're absolutely going to do that a bit differently unless your render is targeting the DOM. Um, so you know, that right there, it, it gives you what you need to do that. Um, how it's done depends on the renderer that you're doing. All right. So let's talk about writing a custom renderer. Um, so st starting right at the implementation point and working backwards, right, you have a render method. All right. um, so this is like a pretty regular looking render method here. We have our render and then you're going to pass in an element and a root container. Um, on DOM, you know, your element is going to be your top level root component. Uh, your root is going to be like you know, document get element by ID root or whatever the kids are doing these days. Um, and, and really, it, it comes down to, you know, first you just check if there is a container. If there is one, you update it. And if there isn't, you create the container. And then you update that. And when you call render, that's what that's doing in a nutshell. <clears throat> um, so here, you know, if, if, you, if you created a container uh, that, that wasn't a document get element by D, like say you were doing a custom render uh, for something else, you could create an instance of it, pass it in here as the container. Alternatively, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't matter, you know, you could just say render my component and build the container internally. It's not a big deal. Um, so custom elements, right? Uh, if, if you ever saw custom tags in different setups, you know, where you're not importing them, you're kind of just using them. Uh, for example, in React, the entire HTML, HTML API is custom tags. You know, JSX is not HTML. So if you have tags for, you know, almost any... HTML element, that's a custom element that React is handling for you. Um, the way that you can do that here is, uh, in your host config, you have a, a method create instance here. And it has a type, props, root container instance, uh, host context. Um, and then in there, you can return you know, create custom instance method. I'll show you what that looks like. So with these, these arguments to this method here, inside you could switch on type. Right, so type is going to be, you know, if we were doing the DOM, type would be H1 or P or div or anything like that. Um, but if you're not working with the DOM, if you're doing something completely different, it could be whatever you want. And in a lot of custom renders, you'll see that. Like in, a, in Blessed, they have like box or it maps directly to the Blessed API. Or you're gonna, uh, you know, here we have dog and cat and whatever you want. And you can just return a new instance of, you know, the actual element that you want. Um, and then your, your custom component that you're returning an instance of will probably have an API like this. Um, so a lot of those things that you're seeing in that console log before and then get passed down to the child on a, on a per element basis. So as you work up the tree, um, you're going to have something like a pen child and it has the child. Right? So if you have that div and then you get to the point where you know, div is going to append something, on the div element itself, you're going to call a pen child and that's going to have, you know, if you're in HTML, you're literally going to call a pen child. Uh, if you do a custom, different kind of renderer, uh, you're going to do something different. I'll show you that in a little bit. So right now, <laughs> I, pr I promise we're going to have some fun. But uh, it's been a little technical thus far, but we're, we're going to have some fun, I promise you. Um, so first, I wanted to review uh, some of the cool renderers out there. Um, my coworker, Matt Hank, just wrote a really, really fun one. Uh, it uses Fiber, and it's called the React Ionize. Right. So we can see a little, little GIF or GIF, depending on how you roll right here. What it does is it lets you create Electron apps, not, not like the HTML portion, but the actual Electron portion uh, with React. Right. So you use React tags, and it'll... I don't know if you've ever tried to create an Electron app and then like spec out a menu. It's devastating. So writing the, the Electron menu in React elements... Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot better in React. All right. So you can see what it actually looks like uh, right here. Uh, so you have an app element, you have menu element, sub menu, about, what have you, and then, then the window element. Um, and this is one of my favorite new renderers. Uh, it, I'm going to be using it on a project that I'll release next week, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You have to wait. Uh, the other one is React Hardware. Uh, so Dustin had a, a stack renderer version of React Hardware, and it was fun. Um, but he rewrote it in Fiber, and he taught me a lot about Fiber. Pretty much everything about Fiber. We had a lot of discussions about it. Um, React Hardware. You can have. Uh, a piece of code like this where you have the board and then you have the, the LED tag. And those correspond to actual hardware. So if you have an Arduino plugged in and the LEDs on a certain pin, um, you, know, you could sit here and do things like tween servos or use set intervals to turn LEDs on and off or build robot crossbows, whatever you want to do. So I built a couple here today and I want to run through them so we can see exactly how this implementation works. Not that one, this one. Okay. So this is a fun one. Um, I wanted to start small with only a couple of methods so that we could check these out. This is an emoji renderer. So this is React DOM with, without creating a brand new renderer. Um, I use React DOM, it's, it's renderer, and kind of just extend it a little so that any time you have a piece of text in your application that can be represented by emoji, it will be represented by emoji. I know, cutting edge stuff. <laughs> but uh, I'll show you how that works here. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the code. Bump that up a little. All right. Everybody good on size? Say something if you're not good on size. All right. Um, yeah, so in here, uh, you can have this, which is you know, just a controlled input and the P tag. And then down here, it just says, I heart beer and chicken. What's up, dog? Um, and, you know, render this just like anything else. And then it renders like this. So you have I heart beer and chicken. What's up, dog? I could say US dollar watermelon guns. <laughs> yeah, and you, you get your emoji from that. And I'll show you how that works uh, right now. Do, do, do. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, it actually didn't take much. And, you know, doing this is something I wouldn't recommend for, like, prod or anything. But, uh, you know, this is how you do it. So I use a emoji, node emoji. And I have a method here, check emoji. What this does is it takes props, checks if the props are a string. And if they are a string, call emojify on it, right? And do that recursively. Up here, I have my emojify function, which goes through the words, runs through them. If it can be emojified, it is emojified. So emojification. Um, and then the points at which you're actually going to want to apply that are finalized initial children. You know, I remember from those console logs before you saw those. Um, you take your props and directly mutate them like a terrible person and say check emoji on there and it'll, it'll take them and turn them into emoji. Also, uh, here in prepare update, so if, you, if, if any update happens to the DOM, like you saw me typing into that input and then it changes it, uh, that's a prepare update is getting called there. And there we, again, check the emoji. And last but not least, create text instance. So if we have any free floating text emoji, they're getting emojified too. You call emojify right there. Um, so you know, if you are working on the web and you do want to do something fun, uh, you don't have to write a, a, whole, a whole another one. You know, React DOM does it fine, and you can just go in there and hook in and do what you will. So that was an example of that right there. Um, now for a, a full custom render with something completely different, uh, I'm going to show you guys how I built React Synth. You might not have heard of it because I didn't put it out yet, but uh, if we look at the implementation here, what you can do here is write synth patches, actual synths like music, with React code. And then you can play them with MIDI. So if we look at this guy and uncomment them here. Ooh, really? Really serious? Okay. 
Um, yeah, so we have oscillators right here, oscillator tags, which, which if, uh, if you've done any synthesis, you know, you, have, you combine oscillators with different envelopes and effects, and that'll give you synthesized instruments. So we have our oscillator here with, with wave types and you know, a frequency function. We have an envelope which controls the shape of the sound, whether it's like a, like a long thing or like a short boop kind of deal. Um, and then we can add effects here, things like uh, low pass filters and reverb. And because it's fiber, we do it in this sweet array syntax, which is tons of fun. Uh, yeah, so let's just start it up just to see what's going on here. Actually, I'll probably want to comment that guy out. The first thing we have here is a wavetable. So the wave here, it can be a named wave, like a sine wave or a saw wave, but it also can be a wavetable, so you can make it sound like an organ. Um, am I plugged in on the sound here? Woo! Whoa, we're having fun here. <laughs> so that, that's a wavetable, right? And I'm controlling that with MIDI. Right, right through here. And there's actually no browser here, because this is, this is Node. This is running directly on core audio. I'm rendering to an instance of you know, this, this audio that we're not even in a browser right now. This is just running. It can be in the browser, and we can do that, and I'll put it in the browser, but that's not what this is right now. Um, so that's a pretty simple one just for the wavetable. What if we were to go ahead and uncomment this one right here? Wow, you're just killing me here today, VS Code. Please comment, uncommenting. All right. So we take this one right here, which is a little bit rowdier, right? So uh, we're going to go ahead and, and take a sine wave here and use that as the frequency. Now, if my calculations are right, this is going to give us dubstep. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I think I'm short on time, so let's go through that, how this is built real quick, and then I'm going to do something even funner. All right. So we have our renderer right here, and we are having fun right here. Oh, yeah. Um, so down here where we have create container, right? we're not passing a container, and we just literally render that, that synth block, right? Um, Okay. So I create the container right here. I say uh, synth manager is new synth manager, and then create the container with that, right? Uh, and then we call update container on our synth manager. Let's look at what the synth manager is, right? This is not the DOM. This is just an object here. So I create a class, class synth. Uh, it has a property synths, right? So we have an array of all the synths that we've created. So if you were to have, uh, you know, an array or return more than one child in the tree there, um, you can have multiple synths, but we just have one right now. So um, you have a couple methods, get synth, add synth, uh, remove synth, right? So when we're doing uh, our update operations, we can add or remove any of these synths. Um, from here, we can head to our, our host config, where we can see some of this magic happen. So we have create instance getting called here. Right? So when it sees any of these tags, it's going to call create instance in our, in our render setup. Here we have create synth instance. Right? We're going to import that right over here from our elements. Right? Create synth instance. And then I'm going to switch on the type. We have uh, oscillator, envelope, an effect, or a pluck, right? which is all the different uh, kind of tags that I actually support. Uh, if we look at OSC here, uh, this is an element, and it extends a, a base one that just has all the methods on it, so this can be a little bit terser. Um, in our constructor, right, we're going to uh, set the type. We're going to set the options that are derived from props. We're going to give it an ID, check if it has any children, and its entity, which is representative of its actual synth. So uh, we have get entity here, right? And what this does is it'll, it'll go ahead and create our... Our synth. So it, it'll compose these all the way up. Here we're, we're getting these children right here. So we check the, the internal children. Anytime add child gets called on this synth, it's going to add it to this internal children setup. Then what it's going to do here is it's going to create its own synth using timber. Um, and then it's going to spread those children in there. So it's going to compose it together up the tree um, until it essentially gives what is given back to the synth manager in that add synth. 
Right here we have options. We can go through, get the options. Um, you see some of these different these methods that we saw before. Append child before mount. Right, we're going to say this internal children child ID equals child, um, and that's how it wrangles these together. This is our container, right? Um, so our container class has append child, right? So we say this synth manager add synth the child, remove child, this synth manager remove synth child.id, um, and update tree. We're going to say this synth manager rebuild, right? So really what we're doing is we're using that host config instead of, you know, operating on the DOM and updating HTML that's represented by our React. What we're instead doing is using it to update different properties and, uh, you know, add and remove pieces of essentially the synth that we're building. So you can apply this to things like hardware, things like music. Um, if you wanted to, you could build like Express with it. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could just for fun. Um, yeah, so that's how that's built. I'm going to push this up to GitHub so you guys can take a closer look. And uh, yeah, let's close this out with something even fun, even funner. Uh, web, I think it's called. Yeah, so this does run on the web as well. And when I was going to come speak out here, I said to myself, what will the Dutch like? What do I know about the Dutch? And what do I know about the Dutch liking? And that's not much. But I know you guys like house music. So I figured I'd put together. <laughs> yeah, so it's MIDI control. You can control it from here. Um, and it works in Node and it works in the browser. That's all I got. Thanks so much, guys.